Military officers in the age of gunpowder were famous for using swords and pistols, but would they have been better off using shields? Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Now, I'm pretty well known um, on my channel for featuring weapons from the age of gunpowder, particularly sabres, various types of sword, and indeed occasionally firearms as well. And I do shoot uh, black powder firearms, so I shoot the uh, firearms of the same period as the swords that I mostly talk about. But a question that often comes up in comments, and in, I've been asked quite a lot of times actually, and I have pondered this question somewhat, is actually, were officers best equipped for their day? Would they have been better off actually if they'd had shields. So the first thing we have to break down is what type of shields they could have used. And uh, obviously they could have had something small like a buckler, which would have been useful in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but which would have been next to useless against firearms. And we have to, of course, recognize that the main threat in this period, whether it's in um, European warfare, American warfare, or indeed in colonial warfare, was from firearms, certainly to the officer. So um, the simple fact is that if we're gonna talk about shields in this period, we really need to talk about bulletproof shields. Now, some of you might instantly be thinking about Captain America or something like that. And some of you might even be thinking, but Matt, you can't make bulletproof shields. Well you'd be wrong. In the age of gunpowder, certainly in the 19th century, you could make bulletproof shields, and they did make bulletproof shields. Remember a guy called Ned Kelly? Um, so he didn't have a shield, but he did make body armor. And whilst it wouldn't have stopped every round available, certainly at the end of the 19th century, in the age of black powder before smokeless propellants came along, nitro, Indeed, you could make um, iron or steel armor that could stop certainly musket, um, uh, certainly pistol shots at close range. And uh, in the best case scenario, you could stop musket shots and even um, some rifle shots. And it would certainly, even if it doesn't stop everything, would massively increase your chances of survival. As a little aside, if I were to make a shield that was hopefully bulletproof by the standards of the day against the firearms which are most prevalent, certainly in close combat, if not necessarily against um, the most powerful rifles of the day, but against uh, close range firearms, particularly pistols um, and things like blunderbuss and uh, carbines and things like that, I definitely would have gone for a steel shield. Um, now it could be any shape. I'm holding a round shield, which is fairly convenient. Um, and in fact, round shields were used in various parts of the world in this period, for example, in India and the Ottoman Empire and so on. Um, but the fact is that you would definitely want to make it of steel. And in fact, when they did make bulletproof armors, even if we go forwards to World War I, then we're really looking at um, carbon steel that is hardened. So it needs to be hardened carbon steel. And in addition to that, you really want probably something that's a laminate. This was something they'd done as early as the 17th century. There were in fact breastplates which were bulletproofed. If you've ever wondered where the term bulletproof comes from, that's where it comes from. The best breastplates were tested with a pistol, with a wheel lock pistol, um, later a flintlock, um, a flintlock pistol. And um, they have a dent on the breast there and that is the bulletproof that shows that they've been proved against a bullet. They'll stop a soft lead bullet at point blank range pretty much, close range. And um, indeed you could just make shields like that. So they wouldn't have to be too heavy or too cumbersome to be bulletproof in that time. Now the funny thing is, despite being asked this question about shields used in the age of gunpowder, uh, many, many times in the past. What actually inspired me to make this video was this new game that I've started playing called War Robots, which is absolutely freaking awesome. It's got robots that are like tanks, basically. I love tanks, I love armor, I love guns, so this is a brilliant game for this. But the reason it inspired this video is because there are mechs in this, there are robots which actually have shields on them. And when you think about something that's a giant robot that's got guns on it, that's also got armor, shields make a lot of sense. This is my hangar here. I've got only two robots at the moment, but I've upgraded one of them quite a lot. Uh, but there's up to 60 robots you can get, and they all have different skills, different types of weapons and armor. They can jump, they can fly, they can do stealth mode, and all kinds of other really cool stuff. This is the hangar where you can see um, all of your robots. As I say, I've only got two at the moment, but let's have a look at this I've one. already upgraded this guy a bit, and you can see that I've done a sweet paint job. You can get different uh, paint jobs. So it's got robots and guns and explosions and what's not to love. It's even got shields and armor in it as well. So uh, why don't you check out my QR code or my link and go and download the game now. It's free to play, free to download. If you download that using my special link here, 
Then you get a starter pack which includes a robot with a weapon plus unique skin, 100 gold and 50,000 silver. And a special bonus for you guys, the first thousand of you to download this game, get a wicked awesome flamethrower that completely frags your enemies. Now I've got to say, my aim isn't very good and I'm still getting to grips with the controls, but it's a lot of fun and it's actually quite intuitive. You can see here that um, I'm trying to target, my targeting isn't very good yet, but I'm trying to target the opponent. When you do, and a lot of the time you miss, you notice, and they're missing you. But when you do, um, then eventually if you get enough shots on target, you're going to destroy them. Something I always try to remind people actually, who haven't tried to shoot moving targets while moving themselves, whether it's with a bow or firearm, you know, airsoft, paintball, whatever. Really, really difficult when you're moving around, trying not to be shot, and trying to shoot someone else at the same time. So go and download War Robots for free right now using my link or QR code and uh, I hope you have a good time playing the game because I'm having a lot of fun at the moment. Now coming back to shields used in the age of gunpowder, the simple fact is that an officer is a prime target. It's a prime target for hand-to-hand -hand combat opponents coming uh, with various types of swords to kill him. If you can take out the leader, you can take out the command and control structure, um, you can demoralize the troops, but also you um, inhibit their ability to coordinate well. Um, hopefully you've got other officers and NCOs who can step in and fulfill that role. But nevertheless, officers are a prime target and we definitely see this in the Boer War, in World War I, in World War II, in the Vietnam War. If you can take out the officer, it's uh, kind of worth more points to your team, essentially, um, to achieving the objective than just taking out um, the uh, private soldiers. So the simple fact is that in the 19th century, officers were not only prime targets to take out for that reason, but they were also prime targets to take out from a sort of kudos point of view, um, potentially uh, j just kind of general morale point of view as well. So the simple fact is that whether you're being attacked with hand weapons or whether you're being attacked with firearms, a shield would be a good idea for an officer in this period. Now, some of you might instantly come back with the point, but yeah, Matt, it makes them an easier target. Well, does it? I, I mean, maybe at extreme long range, but you've got to bear in mind that uh, in, by the standards of the day, officers are, for a start, wearing a different type of uniform, uh, very often which is much more uh, gaudy and ornamented than the uh, private soldiers. And in addition, they are carrying different weapons. So indeed, sometimes you might get a, uh, an officer who carries a rifle. And when we do find this is happening towards the end of the 19th century, it's not necessarily for practical fighting reasons, it's very often simply to make themselves less conspicuous and less uh, of an attractive target to snipers, shall we say. But for most of the 19th century, the standard armament of an officer was pretty much always a sword, and then when they had them available, pistols of various kinds, single shot pistols to begin with, and then ultimately moving on to um, things like this revolver, um, Adam's revolver, later in the night, from about the middle of the 19th century, uh, but particularly in the later half, the latter half of the 19th century. So the simple fact is they're already conspicuous targets. So if they've got a shield, then it doesn't really make them any more conspicuous. Now, some of you, some others of you may quite correctly point out that the officer's main job is not to be fighting. The officer's main job is to be coordinating forces. That's true, but to do that, it's really important to stay alive. And you could very much argue that the sword and the pistol are both weapons of offense and defense. Yes, they're there to protect yourself as an officer in the sort of last ditch um, so you can stay alive, but, but you could say a shield would do that better. And those of us who actually spar with these sorts of weapons will know that uh, sword and buckler, sword and shield are very good weapon sets to stay alive. Um, they're not necessarily the best weapon sets if you want to go out and kill lots of the enemy. Um, there are weapons like pole axes and halberds and big two-handed swords, which are probably better for that. But if you just want to stay alive from a mixture of hand-to-hand -hand combat weapons and missile weapons, particularly close-range missile weapons like pistols, a shield is a very, very good choice. Now, a shield's good choice from two points of view. Number one, if you're actually engaged in combat with a sword, for example, then uh, the shield being in front of you makes you a far more formidable opponent and much diff more difficult to overcome. Okay, so it has an active defense. But in addition to that, it also has a passive defense. That is just simply by virtue of having one, and bear in mind, this could be just as much seen as a badge of rank 
as a sword would or extra plumes on your helmet, um, just by virtue of carrying one, no matter where it is, it covers part of your body, especially if you get into the habit and it could have a gi strap so you could wear it as well, especially if you get into the habit of having it at least covering part of your torso. You're now partially a bulletproof target and of course a bayonet and a swordproof target as well. And bayonets are worth mentioning and spears. So we often fixate on swords on this channel, but actually if you look at warfare in the 19th century, the majority of hand weapons being used in combat were either bayonets or spears, which are obviously similar and related weapons, but one's connected to a firearm. In that scenario, if you've only got a sword, most people agree that the person with a bayonet probably most of the time has a slight advantage over the person with just a sword. It's a very effective weapon combination, the firearm with the bayonet attached, especially on firearms of this period, when you have to remember that with the bayonet attached, there are tall as me, they're six foot um, long, okay, so you've got quite a long reach with them. Admittedly, with modern firearms like the um, M4 or M uh, SA80 or whatever, they're with a bayonet attached, they're very, very short, so you may not get a sense of the, the imposing nature of what a bayonet was in the 19th century. But a big six foot bayonet, or indeed a spear, is quite difficult to face off with a sword. But if you have a shield, as the Highlanders showed in uh, the middle of the 18th century, um, in, in the Jacobite Wars, the Taj, or the shield, was very, very effective at opposing bayonets, or indeed any thrust weapon, because it covers the front of your body. So it enables you to close off the principal target that is vulnerable to bayonets and spears. And by closing off that target, and remember this is bulletproof as well, it enables you to attack the opponent back with a little bit more uh, of a um, fervor um, and less risk to your own torso. But in addition to that, so it should be kind of, I mean, I think most people watching this channel realize that adding a shield to a sword makes for a very effective weapon combination. And it's a weapon combination that we've seen going all the way through back through history, used by ancient Greeks and Romans and uh, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings and everyone else. Okay, so shield and sword, very popular, very successful combination. But... Now, bring in the technology of firearms. So even if you're not using a sword, and I understand some people watching this channel will be like, oh, in the 19th century, swords were obsolete weapons. I don't agree with that. And they were still being used effectively in World War I, to most people's surprise. But um, in the 19th century, I think swords were almost necessary, certainly in colonial warfare, where you were being attacked with hand weapons, where a pistol with five or six shots is not gonna defend your life for as long as a sword can. Uh, but nevertheless, for those of you who think that the sword was obsolete, then you have your pistols. And bear in mind, as lots of people like to point out who study the American Civil War, although I often talk about a British context or a European context, and I talk about an officer having only one of these and not being able to reload it in close combat, so you're limited to five or six shots, uh, in an American context, we know that sometimes they carried multiple revolvers. Well, there's nothing to stop you carrying two or three or however many of these and having a shield as well. Okay, so you've now got a firearm weapon which is more likely to put an opponent down than most sword hits do. It's obviously dependent, a bullet can hit someone in the leg and a sword can hit someone in the throat. And obviously in that case, the sword thrust will be more effective than the, than the gunshot. Uh, but in a lot of situations to the torso and the head, a gunshot will be more devastating than a, than a sword cut or thrust. Um, but with these, if this is a bulletproof shield, and bear in mind, bulletproof shields are a thing admittedly with modern materials that have been used somewhat in a modern by modern SWAT teams and things like that, and even in a military context to some degree, going into buildings. If you've got a firearm and you've got a shield, um, this is a pretty awesome combination. And we come back to Captain America, don't we here? So yeah, absolutely. If you're using these two things together, then that you're basically blocking your main target while being very offensive to everyone around you uh, with your pistol. And if this runs out, you can put that back in its holster and pull out your sword. Or you can do it the other way around. And what was often advised in the 19th century was actually to save the pistol for when you really, really needed it. Use the sword up until that point. But then if you felt that you were <laughs> basically in really big trouble, then pull the, pull the gun out. Um, but in addition to that, some people would say that this is too much of an encumbrance for officers. And I don't necessarily disagree. I think it would have been unpopular if uh, in, let's say, the Crimean War, 1854, 55, 
Um, if British and French officers had been told, you know, oh, we don't like how many of you are being sniped by uh, Russians, um, and so we're going to start arming you with shields so you can protect yourself and be more effective at leading your men, um, and you'll be more effective in close combat when we're storming uh, uh, Sevastopol or wherever else, okay, fighting in hand to hand combat, which did happen in the Crimean War. And um, uh, I suspect it would have been unpopular, and people would have said, oh, it's too much, I don't want to lug that around. But bear in mind, they are already wearing quite encumbering uniforms. If you look at a Crimean War or a Napoleonic War uh, uniform, they're wearing things which are, wouldn't be comfortable to most of us. Their hats or helmets are uncomfortable, their jackets for the most part are quite stifling, they're sometimes wearing very high collars which restrict the movement and make you stand a certain way. Uh, they're wearing boots, sometimes they're wearing spurs when they don't need to on foot, uh, maybe having a police uh, hanging up, uh, which is a type of jacket hanging off the shoulder, all of this kind of stuff. In addition to that, they're wearing swords, let's put the shield down for a second, they're wearing swords slung on low slings that uh, whack into chairs and doors and trees and buildings and everything else and your friends. They swing around, they're quite inconvenient to wear, has to be said, and I suspect a lot of them ended up being carried in the hand <coughs> uh, instead. And uh, they're wearing their firearms as well, so they've already got some encumbrance. Now, that being said, if you add a shield to that, they're going to complain about the extra encumbrance, but there are some ways in which these things can be married together. One idea I had was the sword is until the Sam Brown belt was invented in the 1850s, uh, it was invented and then became popular by about the 1870s, um, the sword was quite, should we say, inconvenient to wear on foot. But if you're fighting on foot, there's no reason why the sword scabbard or sword couldn't be carried or mounted to the inside of the shield. And being so done, you're now still carrying one object. Okay, And that does mean that if you have to draw the thing, you're ready to use both at the same time uh, while having uh, those two things married together. Not to say this is definitely what they should have done, it's just an idea. Equally, there is no reason to suggest why you couldn't have your pistol fitted into a holster on the back of the shield, so it's not there. Now, again, I think it might actually be more comfortable and more convenient to have it on your belt, but I'm just showing that you can combine the shield with some of the other things that you're carrying. And indeed, we know that Indian officers in the Indian Army under British command did carry round shields, and they very often wore them on the back. Um, and uh, even there are accounts of Indian cavalry actually um, receiving, wearing the shield on the back while holding the reins here, and actually receiving cuts on the back while cutting back with their own swords. So there are places you can stick a shield, and it still might have some use, even when you're just wearing it, again as that passive defence. So I hope this has been thought-provoking. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think 19th century officers whether it's in Europe or in, in colonies around the world or whatever, do you think that they would have been better off with bulletproof shields? I really think they would have been. I don't know whether they would have um, tolerated them. I don't know whether they would have carried them or whether they'd just been like, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna carry that around. I don't know whether they would have been terribly effective, but I think that they could have saved some lives and I think that they could have made the officers a far tougher target, both from uh, gunshots and from close combat opponents as well. And I think if they'd been designed correctly, as well as being bulletproof, if they'd been designed correctly, they could have become quite elite emblems of the officer class. A bit similar to how Roman officers had different types of uh, shield and a different way of wearing the sword to the uh, legionaries. Um, anyway, some thoughts there. Share with me your ideas, your impressions. Do you think this is a good idea, terrible idea? Do you have any information about bulletproof shields in the modern world or the historical world. Uh, if you want to talk about Ned Kelly's armour, that's also a very interesting topic that maybe I'll do a video on in the future. Um, but thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you again on Scholar Gladiatoria channel. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done already. And I've also got uh, three extra videos a month on Patreon. So thanks a lot for watching and I hope I'll see you again soon. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.